Okay. Uh, we can start. So um, today we will have some uh, a theoretical lesson now. Then uh, you will present very briefly your journey maps if you if you want. Uh, then we will have a break, and after the break you will work uh, with the third exercise of this course. Okay. Um, so last time we have seen some. Um, some interaction paradigms. We started with some definitions about what is interaction in general, uh, especially in the field of human-computer interaction. Then we have seen some examples of interaction between humans and contemporary AI-based systems. Uh, and so we have seen that there are very different types of, of interaction. And also these kind of systems can are compliant with definitions of AI in different ways. There are some systems that are more autonomous, other systems that are more able to analyze the environment, and so on. And finally, we have, uh, let's say, classified this kind of systems in two main categories. We can have uh, smart tools, so normal objects that have some AI power. Um, and then we have also AI systems that are developed and designed as a sort of companion for the user, like Alexa and, and Jibo. And we have seen that uh, depending on the category of this kind of systems, uh, we can have different characteristics and different problems to be, to be taken into account. Uh, so if you remember, there is, for example, the problem of the Uncanny Valley for, for the uh, AI system that are designed as companion for the user. So systems that pretend to be human, but they are not. And this causes different problems for the users uh, and some frustration. Uh, so today we will uh, explore a little bit uh, how we can design this kind of systems uh, and uh, which tools we can use to design uh, AI systems, obviously uh, with the focus always on human uh, AI interaction, so starting from the human needs. And this is the summary of the lesson. Uh, in the first part, we will talk about designing AI systems in human AI interaction. So we will dig into risks and benefits of AI and how this, these risks and benefits are perceived by humans. Um, and in doing this, we will learn how designing AI systems is different from designing uh, normal technology uh, that doesn't exploit AI. Then we will discuss some design guidelines uh, and tools also for designing this kind of AI systems that have been proposed by Microsoft in this case. But there are a lot of guidelines here, also from uh, Google and Apple, for example. And as I said before, uh, in the second part of the lesson, uh, you will do the third exercise for the exam in which you will try to apply this, these guidelines that we are going to discuss to uh, an AI-based system. And also this time you will work in groups. So let's start to explore the peculiarities of designing uh, AI systems. Um, you probably have already discussed in the first lessons uh, what, is the, what is different uh, in interactive AI systems uh, with respect to, let's say, traditional technology. Uh, so in a traditional user interface, um, clicking on a button will always produce the same result, right? Typically. Uh, the main difference here is that uh, AI systems are uh, performed under uncertainty. Uh, so they can actually be wrong. Uh, they can produce false positives and also false negatives. And this is a characteristic that clearly influences the design of this kind of solutions. And we need to be aware that uh, AI systems may be wrong before starting to design a system that exploits AI. Uh, for example, to minimize uh, some kind of errors while accepting the, the others and also to make explicit to the user that these systems may go wrong. Um, otherwise, unpredictable behaviors will happen uh, and will create disruptive, confusing and even offensive and sometimes dangerous, dangerous situations for the user. 
Uh, this is an example of how an AI system may fail. Maybe you have already seen this, this slide. But anyway, um, this was a chatbot named Tai, uh, implemented by Microsoft. And Microsoft had this brilliant idea, idea of um, training this system automatically by exploiting uh, yeah, a very complex deep learning algorithm, but uh, with Twitter data. Uh, and yeah, they had to shut down the chatbot after a couple of days because in a couple of hours, Ty learned to be uh, misogynist, racist, and it learned all the bad things that you can find in a today's social network. So by using a completely black, mo black box model, uh, the designers of Ty lost control on Ty, and this it is clearly a problem. So what are the errors that we should take into account? Um, let's start with the low stakes examples. So uh, nothing critical here. Um, and what could possibly go wrong when interacting with an AI based system? First of all, there can be uh, relevant errors. So for example, you are traveling for a funeral and the Airbnb app uh, suggests you some fun activities nearby. So the algorithm is just right. I mean, it's actually working, but it's not able to uh, fully understand your uh, contextual situation uh, and also your intention, your current intention. So are those recommendations useful for the current context of the user? Probably not. Another example that you have probably experienced before. You are seated on a long car trip or you are in the middle of an international flight and your smartwatch vibrates and tells you, okay, it's time to get up and walk. Yeah, but I can't, okay? Uh, so also in this case, uh, the smartwatch is not able to, to understand your, your contextual situation. Um, so these are all examples of relevant error. They could be I think simply avoided uh, because, for example, your smartwatch or your smartphone uh, can easily understand that you are, for example, in the middle of an international flight. Um, and so by improving the environment, uh, the analysis of the environment, you can, you can avoid this kind of, of problem. Another kind of low stake example, multiple user similar input. Uh, and this is common, uh, especially in recommender systems. So for example, imagine that you have a Spotify account um, and I don't know, Saturday evening you have used it to play some 1960 pop songs because maybe you organized a party in your house. Um, then the day after your brother or sister used the same account to play his favorite playlist for studying uh, and then today you have listened to some artists that you dislike just for um, making your roommate happy. So at the end, the question is, uh, what music should Spotify recommend to you? And also in this case, the problem is that Spotify uh, is not able to get a complete picture of your, of your contextual situation. And it's, it's not able to understand that there are multiple users here that are using the same, the same account. So these are not critical error and uh, we can also say that it's not a problem for the algorithm itself, it's a design problem because uh, the designer uh, didn't take into account important features to be, to be modeled in this case. Um, so in human AI interaction, um, considering how and when people will interact with your system is a critical part of the design process that need to be uh, taken into account to minimize this kind of, of problems. Okay, we have seen low stakes uh, failures um, and this kind of low stakes failures typically result in AI features that are interrupting or annoying for the user. Um, and so these kind of features are basically useless uh, when these uh, errors arise. But the same kind of problems may happen also for high stakes, when AI, for example, causes active harm 
or when AI reveals, for example, some private information about, about users violating uh, uh, its privacy. Um, or also when AI shows uh, offensive content, and we have seen an example with the Thai chatbot. Um, and if you uh, are designing and maybe selling an AI-based product, uh, you can have serious consequences with this kind of errors. Uh, your users will probably stop using the system uh, and move to another system. Uh, you may have press and legal troubles, especially for high stakes problem, and you will probably receive bad reviews, uh, discouraging others from, from using your system. So the question is how to design these kind of systems, taking into account that they may fail. Uh, we have seen last time that um, a vast majority of AI-based systems can be seen as smart tools. So normal objects that have some AI uh, power. Uh, and being tools, the design of these systems should, at least in theory, uh, obey to well-known design principles that are known in the literature since decade. Uh, that, and these principles are strictly related to the gulf of evaluation and the gulf of execution that we have seen uh, last time. These are, for example, uh, the principles of interaction design proposed by Donald Norman, the same Donald Norman of the model of interaction that we have seen last time. And basically, these four principles describe uh, how an artifact, also a physical artifact, uh, should be designed. Okay? Um, one of these principles is uh, visibility. So the system should make all the possible uh, operations that it offers visible to the user. In ACI, the possible operations are called affordances. And so an affordance is an action possibility offered by, by a system. Um, a signifier instead is uh, how an affordance is made visible to the user. So the principle of visibility means uh, that all the affordances should have uh, a clear signifier. The second principle is um, feedback. Obviously, it's important to provide a proper communication about the results of an action performed by the user. So this is a communication uh, from the system to the user that should allow users to build a better mental model with trials and errors. Um, but there are at least two kinds of feedback. One is about the action uh, results, and the other one is about the action itself. So making clear that the action has taken place. Um, usually in the physical world, you don't need the first, uh, the, the action feedback uh, because you can actually feel an object uh, and you can feel for example that a physical light switch has been pressed so it changed the position and you also feel a physical click um, this is not the case uh, uh, in the digital world at least sometimes because um, think about for example a button on a touch screen interface so you need also to provide a feedback to convey the feeling that the action has been performed by the user. The third principle uh, of interaction design uh, is constraints. It's something that is uh, at the opposite of visibility. Uh, in this case, with con constraints, we mean that we can also limit possibilities to guide actions uh, and to avoid, for example, errors. So actions that we know are wrong we should prevent them. So the user, uh, we should block this kind, this kind of actions. And finally, there is consistency. Uh, and we have also, in this case, two kinds of consistency. The internal consistency means that uh, similar things should look uh, similar. And at the opposite, uh, different things should look different. An example of a bad internal consistency is a user, a user interface that uh, uses uh, buttons with different shapes. This obviously creates confusion and may lead to errors and wrong mental models. And then there is also an external consistency. Uh, something that looks familiar should also act familiar. 
So buttons, for example, look like physical buttons in graphical user interfaces, so I can recognize, for example, that I can press them. Unfortunately, uh, AI system can violate this kind of principles, um, and especially consistency and error prevention, because they are not deterministic, as we have learned in the last lessons. They are inherently inconsistent. Indeed, uh, these kind of systems um, are not consistent by design. Um, they often improve over time, um, and sometimes you don't want to prevent errors, because maybe your system actually learns from errors. Think about, for example, reinforcement learning and technologies like that. Like that. So some established guidelines and principles of interaction design uh, don't really apply 100% to this kind of systems. And in the slide, there are two examples of, of inconsistency. For example, in um, auto-completion uh, uh, systems, um, you type some letters and you get the word completed. Uh, but this kind of system may respond differently over time because the system is improving. So at the beginning, it probably starts with some uh, very probable words uh, in the language that you are using. And then as long as you type, it learns your favorite words and uh, your preferences, uh, and it starts recommending uh, other kind of results. And this is by design. It's, it's good. It's a good characteristic of the system. But we don't have consistency here. And similarly, if you perform the same Google search on two different computers, you will get slightly different results. And also in this case, it's a matter of personalization. It's not an error. So if we go back to the definition of AI that we used last time, we have seen that there are two main characteristics that uh, characterize AI-based systems with respect to traditional objects. Um, one is analyzing the environment, and this means doing some recognition, right, uh, on a more or less complex environment. And the other aspect is taking some actions autonomously. And having a degree of autonomy uh, means doing some prediction. So predicting something that may happen in the future, and how to do that, uh, at least in most cases. So the fact that AI systems need to recognize and predict uh, something obviously also influences the design of, of these uh, systems. And as far as I understand, most of you have some background in machine learning. So as you know, recognition and prediction um, yeah, can be seen as two faces of the same coin. Uh, recognizing something in a noisy environment means classifying some, some items, while prediction is a sort of classification of something that will happen in the future, right? Uh, but from the point of view of machine learning, these two characteristics are very similar. Um, so we typically have two dimensions here. The reference, something that we know that is true, and uh, the prediction or the recognition of the system, okay? And to simplify, if you consider a binary decision, so something that can be positive or, or negative, uh, you have a positive or negative uh, decision with respect to a positive or negative reference. So if we have, for example, a positive decision about something that we know that it's positive, uh, we have a true positive. Uh, and at the same time, if we have a negative decision on something that it's, we know that it's negative, we have a true negative. And these are, these are the correct choices. Then we have also errors, and we can have, for example, uh, false positives and uh, uh, false negatives. So in this case, the, the, uh, in this last case, for example, the decision is negative, but the reference point is, is positive. And to measure if your system works, uh, you have many different metrics, but probably the simplest ones are precision and, and recall. So do you know what precision uh, and recall are? Hopefully, yes. Can you explain?
Yeah, there are some machine learning people here, I think. Okay. Why the record is the true element with respect to all the real true, the, the predicted true elements that are, uh, that are re in real true, mm -hmm. with respect to all the, uh, all the real true elements. Okay. These are the formulas, right? Uh, so, just to summarize, uh, precision is defined, yeah, as you, your colleague said, as the number of true positives on all the positives. Um, and it gives an indication on uh, how much I'm correct when I'm saying that something is positive. So if I don't have any false positives, I basically have uh, a precision of 100%, right? Uh, but as soon as I make some errors, my precision drops down. So when you hit a target, that's precision. Uh, recall is a little bit more complicated. Um, it's defined as the true positives or over the true positives and false negatives, so all the positive cases, and it defines uh, how much I left out, I don't left out important things with my, with my predictions or classifications. So as you know from machine learning, when you are designing your uh, AI system, you can choose to optimize for precision or optimize for uh, recall. Typically, um, precision and recall are two conflicting metrics. So uh, if you increase the precision, uh, your recall, uh, you reduce the recall, typically. And on the other hand, uh, you can increase the recall, but then probably your precision will go down. Uh, for example, what is the easiest way to maximize recall? how you can have a system with 100% recall. Predicting only a class, yeah. For, for, for example, uh, if we consider a binary decision uh, as before, if I say that everything is, po is positive, I have 100% recall, right? But of course, your precision goes down. Of course, in machine learning, uh, you know how to deal with this metric. Uh, you would probably try to find a trade-off between this kind of uh, metrics, between uh, precision and recall. But let's put this in the context of human AI interaction, where our design process should really start from, from human needs. And in this case, you can actually decide if it's better to optimize a system for precision or optimize for, for recall. On the basis of the goal of the system and uh, more importantly, on the basis of the human needs. So if the worst thing in our system is having false alarms, for example, then it, it will probably be a good idea uh, to design a system that has a high precision. On the other hand, if the worst thing is missing a positive, then you should think about some AI system uh, with a high recall, even if uh, this means to reduce precision. So an example of a case, what is an example of a domain in which it's probably better to optimize for recall, in your opinion? Medical domain. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, the medical domain, because you can accept to have some false positives, but you don't really want to miss any real positives. Okay? Optimizing for precision is instead something that you want, for example, in critical systems. So if you are designing an autonomous car or maybe a nuclear plant, uh, you will probably try to optimize for precision. So I propose to you a quick exercise uh, that doesn't count for the exam. It's just a way to discuss these kind of topics. Um, it's again a group exercise. Um, so in your group, you should briefly discuss the examples of AI systems that we have seen in the last lesson. And for each of them, you should decide 
if, in your opinion, it's better to design them uh, for precision or for recall. And you should also briefly explain why, okay? Uh, so I will give you 10-15 minutes. You can also, if you want, complete a slide. Uh, the link points to a set of Google Slides with a template where you can write your, your own decision and then we'll, we'll discuss this kind of, of examples, okay? 10 minutes.
<ride> l'esercizio. Dovete scegliere se... Solo scegliere, scegliere non due. spiegare cosa succede se ottimizzi per la precisione. No, 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 o... scegliere. Quindi scegliere se, come lo progettereste voi, ottimizzando ah, okay. per precision o per recall e perché. Ok, quindi lì nella casella spieghiamo sì, esatto. perché abbiamo scelto. Esatto. Just to, to clarify, you need to select if it's better, in your opinion, to optimize for precision or optimize for recall. So imagine that you are designing this kind of systems and you have to make a choice between precision and recall, okay?
Okay, let's discuss some, some examples, also based on your, <coughs> on your discussions. So, for example, uh, what about Alexa? Who says that it's better to optimize for precision? Okay, why? Okay, you have probably less activation, less false activations. Okay, that's true. Okay. And yeah, with less activation, uh, you probably don't annoy too much the user. That's true. Anyone disagree with this proposal? Yeah? Okay. To avoid that the user want to uh, use Alexa, but uh, it does not uh, activate. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, there is nothing wrong or 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 right here. It's probably this is the case in which you will probably try to find uh, a trade-off between the two the two metrics. Uh, Let's try with Gmail. That is something that um, that has a binary decision, right? It's spam or it's not spam. Precision. Uh, everyone agree? No. There is one recall. So le let's start with the motivation for precision. What is the motivation? Okay, so uh, there is the risk of classifying uh, as a spam important messages. Okay, so probably I agree with this solution, but let's listen for... Personally, I also agree with this, but if I, if I uh, think for a, a standard user, let's say a person that uh, does not... Uh, Mm -hmm. I would like that everything that uh, he sees in uh, this folder is just okay, and if uh, he is meant to wait for some uh, emails that are important, they can uh, go to search them in the spam. Okay. Uh, it probably it also depends from uh, the the kind of user. So if you receive several important emails, if you use your email as your primary communication channel, probably it's better to optimize for precision because then there is the risk that uh, some, some important messages uh, are in the spam and I forget to check uh, them in the spam. But yeah, sometimes uh, a lot of spam is also annoying. So. But yeah, in this case, I would probably uh, uh, decide to optimize for precision. Uh, so maybe in this case, it's, it's better uh, precision, I think, personally, obviously. Um, what about the Google Nest? Oops. Uh, and this is precision. So precision in this case means uh, setting the right temperature, I think. So. Yeah, I see it from the point of uh, like since it's the same is to waste less uh, energy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So probably it's better precision, yeah. Right? Yeah, my opinion. So if we consider the goal of saving energy, probably it's better to design the, the system for precision, right? It depends on the goal. If I want to optimize the oil consumption precision, precision, maybe the right choice. But if I want 
want to uh, satisfy the user needs, yeah. uh, uh, the all, uh, should be better. Probably. OK. And what about uh, the Amazon robots, so the Amazon warehouse? Sorry? Recall. Why? Uh, because uh, I don't want to miss any two boxes. For example, uh, if the robot has to uh, select some item, I don't want any uh, faults. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, I don't want to miss some two boxes. For example, I don't want to miss any item. Uh, mm -hmm. But let's recap what, what, what are the characteristics of this example. There are two kinds of, of uh, characteristics here. One is uh, two kinds of tasks. One is locating items. So there is an order, an order and the robot needs to locate an item um, and to... Uh, exactly. So in this case, it's better to optimize for precision or recall? It's not a prediction task here. The robot just needs to locate the item, following the path, and pick up the item. I think you recall because uh, uh, I, I need to pick up all the items I need to pick up. Uh, if, if I pick up an item that is not uh, requested, I don't think it's a uh, problem. Yeah, and, and so you would optimize for precision, right? Because I need to pick up exactly those items. Is it true? But it, I mean, probably it depends if uh, the, the robot uh, is the one that uh, finalizes the packet or there is a human intervention then? Uh, probably there is a human intervention. I, I don't know exactly how it works, but. I also think that this kind of task, so locating item, it's something that probably happens without any machine learning. So uh, it's just sensors to follow a path and scan a barcode. Uh, so in this case, probably it's better to optimize for precision. I need to precisely hit the target to pick up an object. Mm -hmm. And I asked the robot to pick up 20 items. Yeah. And uh, he picked up 19 right items. Okay. And wrong. Okay. Uh, I would prefer as a human, as a skill operator, to have maybe more to items to be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Why, that's why this depends on how it, it works, uh, obviously. It's yeah, but it could be. Robot. Yeah, yeah. It that could be true. Okay. Okay. We we did a completely different vision. Mm -hmm. We thought about the people detecting people detection. Okay. So we said that it's obviously better to detect person mm -hmm. if there is no one in the room than the opposite. So yeah, it's better to detect if there is someone you have to be familiar to talk. Okay. Okay, obviously this also depends on, on the task that you are analyzing. So uh, this is a big system that have uh, many different features. So it's also depend on the feature. And there is also another feature that in my opinion, uh, it's better to optimize it for recall. I don't, rem um, I don't know if you remember the video of the last time, but there is a feature in which probably uh, there is a lot of machine learning. If you remember, the robots uh, pick up uh, a deck uh, for, for satisfying an order. But then, after the order is satisfied, they have to decide where to put the deck back. And this position actually depends on the probability that the items in the deck uh, will be involved in subsequent orders. Okay, 
So for very common items, the deck will be probably um, put uh, near the human operator, otherwise no. And in this case, probably it's better to optimize for, for a call, right? Because I prefer to have something near, even if it's not useful, uh, rather than missing an object uh, that, that I really need quickly. Okay, I, I think that Jibo is uh, like Alexa, so let's keep it. And what about the camera, the smartphone camera? We optimize it for a call. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, these kind of systems are designed probably for non expert users because the expert user can manually, for example, activate the pro mode, but yeah. Okay. So as you can see, uh, we can uh, take different decisions uh, on the basis of the user needs. So it, it's important to start thinking about uh, who are our users and what are their, their needs. Um, but yeah, the exercise was very specific. Um, and its goal was to understand uh, that in human AI interaction, we can exploit metrics that typically belong to the AI research field, uh, but we should exploit them asking ourselves how they impact humans. Now, in general, uh, besides relating metrics like precision and recall to human needs, how can we design uh, these kind of systems um, more, uh, in, in more generally? Um, I think that also this slide, you have already seen also this slide in some previous lessons, but just to recap, um, several researchers in the past um, said that uh, AI and ACI are in some ways two very similar research fields, at least in theory. Um, so both AI and XCI, as is reported in the slide, explore the nexus of computing and intelligent behavior. In XCI, you try to uh, find approaches and methodologies to allow an easy and productive uh, interaction between humans and computers. And with AI, it's somewhat the same. You develop intelligent systems uh, that should improve our lives. Uh, in practice, the two research fields are clearly separated um, and connections between the two were uh, very difficult in the past. But in the last few years, some researchers, including Banks Nederman, that is one of the most famous XCI researchers, started to highlight the need of having um, a better connection between AI and XCI. And there are nowadays a lot of studies on what they call human-centered AI. So, AI systems that focus on amplifying, augmenting, and enhancing human performance. Um, so uh, these researchers clearly don't want to eliminate AI uh, and what we have already achieved with the scientific progress, obviously. It's rather a shift on perspective from measuring algorithm performances only uh, to consider humans in the loop. And the exercise uh, was an example of, of this kind of, of, of uh, human-centered processes. So we use uh, performance metrics, but uh, the focus is always on the user. So following a human-centered process means starting from the people that will use the system and not from data and feature-oriented processes. Um, then you have also to decide when to use AI and when it's better not to use it. Because yeah, you may need AI, uh, but maybe there are parts of your system that probably work better without AI. 
You have also to understand when to automate something and when to focus on augmentation. And I think that you have already discussed this topic in, in the panel, right? And finally, you should really try to balance the uncertainty of uh, an AI system with proper expectations and feedback. So we know that AI may go wrong. Uh, let's balance this by making users able to understand why and form a correct mental model of the system. Let's dig into some of these uh, topics. And first of all, um, let's discuss about uh, when to AI or when not to AI. This slide is from Google. Uh, so as I said to you before, Google, Apple, Microsoft all have some very recent guidelines on uh, human AI interaction. Um, but, and this is a tangible example of how human AI interaction is a hot topic today. Um, so Google um, say that after identifying user needs uh, and understanding how you can solve these needs, you can ask yourself uh, if AI can solve the identified needs in a unique way or not. So, um, you can see in the slide uh, that there are some suggestions um, to identify when AI is probably better and when AI is probably not better. For example, uh, AI is probably better when the core experience requires recommending different content to different users. So uh, when there is a recommender system, obviously we need some AI uh, technology. Uh, AI is probably better when uh, the core experience requires prediction of future events or when personalization will improve the user experience and, and so on. Then there are other examples that uh, classify uh, when AI is probably not better. So for example, when the most valuable part of the core experience is its predictability, regardless of context or additional user input. So when uh, same input means same output, uh, in this case probably it's better not to have AI. Um, or when the cost of errors is very high. Um, or for example, when people explicitly tell you that uh, they, don't want, they don't want a task automated or augmented. Okay, so with this kind of guidelines and tables, we can reason on our systems uh, before designing them to select the right technology. When we decide to use AI, an important step is also to analyze the characteristics of the features, of the AI features that we are going to use. And we have seen before in the exercise that obviously a system may offer different features and different features may have different goals and so we should design them in different ways. Um, and we should also understand, uh, analyze how these features will be perceived by the users. Um, in this way we can also understand uh, or maybe uh, guess which is the tolerance to errors of the users. Um, and this is strictly linked to the definition of human AI interaction, because if your users don't trust the system uh, because it's not reliable or safe, your system is simply useless and probably it won't be used at all. Uh, so the role of the AI features is important here and we can classify them in different ways. Uh, they can be critical or complementary, proactive or reactive, visible or invisible, uh, and dynamic or static. And you can have different combinations. So an AI features, feature may be, for example, critical, proactive, invisible, and dynamic, and another one can be complementary, reactive, visible, and static. Okay? So what is a critical feature? Uh, it's something that uh, let's say, strongly influence how the system works, and without it, uh, the system is, is useless. So the more critical a feature is, the more you need accurate and reliable results, obviously. And if you are not able to reach such a level of accuracy, 
and reliability for a critical AI feature, probably it's better not to use AI. Um, on the other hand, the complementary features uh, have a higher user tolerance because the system can still work uh, even without them or when they produce uh, poor results. For instance, let's have some example. Uh, Face ID, the technology through which you can unlock your smartphone, uh, at least in iPhone. Is it critical or complementary in your opinion? Complementary. Someone disagree? Okay, but yeah, um, I think that it, in some ways it's critical. Um, yeah, you can have also other methods to unlock the phone, this is true. Um, but it's in some ways critical. It's not critical for the smartphone, but if it doesn't work, uh, users will simply stop using it, okay? So for this reason, probably it's critical. Instead, uh, word suggestions on a smartphone keyboard. In this case, probably is complementary, yeah. Uh, it's on the top of the keyboard, uh, but if it produces some wrong um, prediction, I can simply ignore it and I can continue to, to type without without any problems. Now, proactive versus reactive. Um, as the name suggests, proactive features can pop up even without any user input. Uh, so by providing unexpected and sometimes serendipitous results. So these features uh, take the initiative um, while reactive features uh, are instead uh, invoked by the user in, in a way um, and typically help you uh, while you are performing uh, a task. So in this case people don't explicitly ask for results coming from a proactive feature and so this is the reason why they can be annoying if, if they are wrong. Um, so there is a higher probability for proactive features to be more annoying than, than reactive ones. But they can be useful if they are correct and also interesting, but they need to be used with care. Um, they can be useful at the right moment. Uh, if you use Gmail, uh, you probably experienced its proactive auto-completion feature. This is proactive, you didn't ask Gmail to complete your word. Uh, but the suggestion is easy to ignore, so it's, it is probably a good example of a proactive, of a proactive feature. Another characteristic of AI features, visible or invisible. Um, so clearly the people impression of the reliability of a feature uh, and of a result of this feature can also depend on whether the feature is visible or invisible. If a feature is visible, it's something that I can see um, while I'm interacting with it. Um, so I will be probably more likely to have more trust in the system. Um, this is harder with invisible features. So uh, for example, you know that your smartphone probably has some strategies to optimize uh, battery consumption, for example, but you don't really understand how it, how it works and sometimes you are uh, even not really sure that it's working. So it's difficult to, for the feature to provide a feedback on its reliability because it's, it's invisible. And the last characteristic, dynamic versus uh, static. Um, the difference here is that automatic features uh, uh, improve over time. So face ID of your phone, for example, is probably able to improve its capability of recognizing you uh, with trials and errors. Uh, and the more you use this feature, the more they should work better. Static features instead are fixed, except obviously when there are some software updates. Uh, obviously also improvements on AI features, on automatic features affect user experience and dynamic features often have some forms of calibration and feedback. Um, 
think about the cold start problem in recommender systems. Uh, the recommender first asks you some movies, for example, that you like to calibrate and recommend you uh, the first set of recommendations. This typically doesn't happen with, with static features. And finally, the last simple rule in designing uh, interactive AI systems is uh, do not overuse feedback requests. Otherwise, uh, users will get annoyed. So especially with proactive dynamic features, uh, uh, you should find a trade-off. Otherwise, uh, your users will think that your system is, is not really smart, uh, but it's rather stupid. So keep your feedback requests for high stakes failures, uh, the ones that we really need to, to avoid. So um, we have seen a set of human-centered principles uh, that should be applied when designing AI uh, systems, but how can we apply them, let's say, in a structured way, OK? Um, as I said before, uh, big tech companies like Google, Apple, and Microsoft um, nowadays have their own guidelines and tools for human-centered AI. And in this course, we will explore in more details the human-centered AI framework by Microsoft. Uh, yeah, actually, Microsoft Research, that is Microsoft, but uh, it's the same company, but it's the research part, so it's quite independent from the corporate part. Um, so and it doesn't need to sell anything so we can trust Microsoft research I think um, they created these guidelines for human AI interaction um, they actually provide a toolkit much bigger than just guidelines and we will see a specific tool in a moment and the final goal is to assist you in creating interactive AI systems uh, with a human-centered approach um, there are also physical cards uh, but they can also be found online. These cards uh, are colored, and each color represents uh, a given interaction phase. Um, and in the back of each card, there is also um, some uh, examples. There are 18 guidelines split in four different phases, and they define what, should, what you should consider uh, initially in a design phase, during the interaction, when something goes wrong, and over time. Obviously, this kind of guidelines uh, can be considered as a sort of heuristic, okay? So they don't apply always, but yeah, they can be a good starting point uh, for designing AI systems. And the guidance are like this one. Um, so initially, uh, this guideline tells you that uh, you should make clear how well the system can do what it can do. So set the right expectation and help the user understand how often the AI system may make mistakes, especially for critical failures. And on the back of this card, Microsoft gives us uh, this example of a contemporary system that follows, uh, in a way, such a guideline. And it says the recommender system in Apple Music uses language such as we think that you will like these songs to communicate uncertainty. So it doesn't say for sure you will like this song or this music is for you, for example, but we think that. Okay? So even subtle changes are important in this, uh, in this case, in this phase. Another guidelines to be implemented in this case during the human AI interaction. Mitigate social biases. And the explanation says, uh, ensure that the AI system language and behaviors do not reinforce undesirable and unfair stereotypes and biases. And the example is quite straightforward. Uh, the predictive keyboard implemented by Android uh, suggests both genders when typing a pronoun starting with the letter H. So it doesn't have a bias towards male or female. These guidelines should be instead implemented when something goes wrong in the interaction between humans and AI systems. In this case, we should support efficient correction by making it easy to edit, refine, or recover when the AI system is wrong. 
And they use this, the example of Bing, but with Google search, it's probably the same. Uh, when Bing, Bing automatically corrects spelling errors in search queries, it provides the option to revert the query as originally typed with just one click. Okay? And finally, the last example is um, this guideline that should apply over time, so when the system is, let's say, in production, uh, that is, um, convey the consequences of user actions. Uh, and the explanation is um, immediately update or convey how user actions will impact future behaviors of the AI system. Also in this case, there is an example. So again, in Apple Music, uh, when the user taps the like or dislike button for a recommendation, there is a pop-up that informs the user that they will receive more or fewer uh, similar recommendations. Okay, so this was just four examples, but there are actually 18 guidelines of this, of this kind. Uh, to summarize, uh, these guidelines can be applied to uh, interactive AI systems and you will try to apply these guidelines in, in the next exercise of, of today. Uh, as I said before, there are other kind of guidelines uh, like the one by Google and Apple and there are not only guidelines. Uh, um, so the last link, for example, uh, is a toolkit by Microsoft that allow you to see the guidelines, but also examples, design patterns, uh, and interactive tools. So let's try to see if I can open it. Okay. Uh, so in the library part, there are the guidelines, so you can explore them interactively, but there are also other kind of, of tools. For example, you can explore some uh, design patterns, so flexible and actionable solutions for implementing the guidelines. And there is also a playbook that is a tool for anticipating and designing solutions for human interaction failures. Um, so through this tool, you can uh, uh, okay. You can select, for example, uh, which systems you are trying to design and implement. For example, let's say that we are trying to design a conversational assistant. Uh, then you can select, for example, what is the primary input modality for your conversational assistant. Let's select speech. Um, and yeah, then you can also select other kinds of parameters. So, for example, if your conversational system have a clear way of knowing when it should trigger. So, if I select yes, this is, for example, the case of Alexa that, uh, that has the wake word Alexa. So, if uh, I want to uh, tell a command to Alexa, I need to, to call it or no, it depends. And on the basis of your choices, as you can see, on the right part of this interface, um, Microsoft suggests you some scenarios uh, through which you can test your solution. It suggests you some, some errors that typically happens in this case so that you can analyze them and maybe prevent them. So it's really a tool for start designing your solution and it will be also useful probably for the last exercise of this course in which you will design and hopefully prototype your own conversational assistant. Okay? Any questions? Sorry, I, I didn't understand. What is the panel output when you select on the... Uh, it's something that is built as long as you select some parameters. So, for example, uh, this, the selection of this parameter uh, will probably result in some more input errors or some more scenarios to be, to be okay. analyzed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, not only guidelines, but also uh, scenarios 
And so situations in which maybe a conversational assistant with this kind of parameters uh, typically have. So, um, for example, your system will take speech as its primary input modality. Here are some scenarios to consider, including your user testing protocol. It's something to test your, your, your design. Uh, Uh, probably yes. I, I asked you that just because I'm not able to read the screen. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, for example, these are all uh, response generation errors that these kind of systems typically have. So, for example, these systems may make uh, ambiguous results. Uh, so they suggest you to include at least one ambiguous scenario in your testing to uh, make sure that you avoid this kind of errors. Um, okay, so it, it helps you also in reasoning about... Exactly. So probably you will start by designing your system by exploiting the guidelines that we have seen before. And then when you have a first prototype of your, de uh, of your design, you can test it with, with this kind of, of tool. Okay. Okay. okay, if you have no questions, um, I'm really curious about your journey maps. So in this uh, half an hour before the break, I would like to see a presentation of your journey maps. Um, a very brief presentation, as I told you last time, so three, five minutes maximum. Uh, so I will ask each group to come here. You can also use my PC or you can connect your laptop, maybe one person per group, it's, it's okay, uh, to present your, your journey maps, okay? Um, so I would start with group number, let's see. So let's try to mirror the display. So let's start with group number one. <laughs> sí, sí. Uh, Qual è il file? Solo per... Ok, ecco qua. Ok. Eh, sì, forse è un po' scomodo. Ti conviene usare le frecce. Ups. For this project, we decided with my group to design two different journey maps. Uh, one that represents uh, our expectation in our morning with AI, and the other one that represents uh, the reality of uh, what happens in, in our morning. Both of the maps uh, have uh, the same main task, but uh, now I want to describe a little bit in details uh, the, the differences. 
The first task is waking up and what we, we would like to have is a phone then that uh, gently wakes uh, us up and maybe, or in the case of Andrea, uh, monitors our parameters during a run uh, outside. But uh, what uh, actually really happened is that there is an alarm that uh, starts ringing and we have to stop with our finger. And uh, for example, if we try in my case to check uh, the quality of my sleep, uh, in the most of the cases, the estimation is, is not correct. Uh, and this uh, uh, makes me more frustra frustrating uh, in, in, uh, at the beginning of my morning. In the second task, uh, we have breakfast. Uh, and what we would like to have uh, is uh, some recommendation or suggestion about music, news uh, or videos that uh, fits uh, our taste. Uh, but what actually really happened is that uh, the suggestion in most of the cases are not correct and this uh, is another source of uh, frustration. The third task is uh, uh, getting ready and uh, in this case, uh, in particular me, I would like to have a personal suggestion about the correct outfit to wear, maybe by considering the task, the, the schedule of the day and the weather outside. But what really happens is that we, all of us, finally pick up a random outfit without knowing if it is correct or not for, for our day. Uh, the, third uh, the, the next step is uh, um, checking our agenda. And uh, it would be great to have uh, maybe a vocal assistant that uh, tell us uh, what are uh, our daily appointments uh, in order to avoid what ac actually happened uh, that uh, uh, is to forget something that maybe could be useful for the day. In the next task, then there is the uh, um, route, the trip on, uh, on our lecture room or on, on our work. And in this case, uh, we would like to have uh, a, a plan or a route to fast uh, reach uh, our, our office or the lecture room. But what uh, really happened is that uh, uh, we experienced, uh, and in this case in particular Simone, <coughs> a sense of loss when uh, uh, he arrives on the campus. And finally, when we arrive at uh, our office or at our workspace, uh, we would like to uh, get faster into the building or into the campus, maybe uh, by using, for example, a, an algorithm for face identification that stores uh, our, all uh, our information, uh, for example, the new pass uh, this time. But what uh, really happened is that uh, we have to wait in a queue for a long time just to show our green pass uh, or to pass our belt. So our conclusion is that uh, AI doesn't mean that uh, the life is better, but definitely it would be a, a great uh, improvement in, uh, in our routines. Okay. So group number two, uh, I closed. Uh, do you remember the group number? Yeah. Volete collegare il computer o usate questo? Sì, sì, è già qua. Eh, come si chiamava il file? Giulia Bodo. Ok, se usate le frecce poi. Ok, grazie. Il microfono. Metto in modo da vederla anche io le slide. <laughs> Good morning, we are group number two and uh, for this exercise we decided to analyze our trip from uh, our home to Polito and uh, we found some 
common themes and uh, some common uh, way in which we get in touch with uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, also uh, we try to, to identify when uh, we would like or wouldn't like that uh, artificial intelligence uh, came in. So starting from uh, the first uh, point, which is our home, we found that uh, the majority of us was uh, wake up by uh, an Alexa alarm. And uh, we would like to have uh, some devices able to switch on the light so to help us during our preparation in the morning. And uh, also some domotic stuff to help us uh, to prepare the breakfast, for example. But, uh, for example, we don't want that artificial intelligence came in uh, during uh, our personal care because, uh, you know, it would be a little bit strange. And uh, we also don't, wor don't want uh, some uh, devices able to lock uh, the house door. Then we have to move from home to the train station, the most of us. And uh, here we would like to have some suggestions for the faster road, for example, and uh, also to understand uh, which is the, the best way to reach the, the station. And um, maybe it would be useful if uh, in the future that we are available to some automated driving uh, system to use them in order to find parking. That uh, sometimes is a difficult task in when you are too late to have also the time to find a, a park. And uh, when we are to the train station here, we want to make it quicker, the, the ticket uh, procedure, in order to save time. And uh, we think that the media artificial intelligence can be useful in order to uh, organize the train's movement uh, so the departure and arrival from uh, the station. And um, also, uh, maybe a both assistant uh, can be useful in order to buy the ticket uh, in a most uh, fast way. And uh, then we have the road <laughs> by train. Yes, so uh, when we arrive in the train station, we can decide to, to have, for example, uh, also the, the ticket checking that is. Uh, something that is not available right now, so uh, that also the automatic cleaning of the train, for example, like using a Roomba or uh, something like that, that can be useful. So uh, we decided to concentrate on what uh, can be useful uh, with uh, artificial intelligence and with the green one, with the green stuff, uh, what is actually available. Then uh, when we arrive uh, Torino train station, uh, for example, uh, we would like to have uh, a plan uh, to, to reach Politecnico, so uh, some artificial intelligence can, uh, for example, advise us uh, which is the, the buses that is the most useful to, to reach the, the university. And uh, when uh, we are uh, at the university, for example, uh, as also the other group said, uh, we would like to have uh, fast green pass checking uh, with some uh, I don't know, the, uh, face ID or uh, uh, advices uh, on which is the closest uh, place to, to buy some snacks and also uh, for example uh, which is the fastest path to, to reach uh, the room where the, the lecture will, uh, will be attended. Okay, uh, then we have uh, analyzed our net uh, with respect to the interaction with the AI at the different uh, uh, steps in our journey and uh, uh, we found out uh, four common uh, kinds of interaction that is uh, uh, voice comments that are present or should be present in all the steps uh, for example, in the smart uh, home uh, devices uh, or uh, uh, in the uh, NAPS system for uh, uh, the, the, the indications of the correct road or correct uh, uh, transport, transport uh, systems. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, device setup is required uh, because uh, uh, we have uh, to manually um, uh, 
set up the correct uh, alarm clock, for example. Uh, the user interface reading, uh, because uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, some apps uh, on our phones, uh, uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, fundamental at home uh, when we have, uh, for example, to to configure some uh, uh, smart uh, devices and uh, at to the train station uh, for, for example, buying the tickets uh, uh, and uh, also uh, at the uh, uh, Torino train station for the same reason and finally uh, contactless scanning systems uh, that for example are at the train station uh, in the subway for example when we have uh, to, to scan the tickets uh, and uh, we um, put uh, it also at the Polito if there, there will be a system uh, that allows uh, to automatically check uh, the green pass uh, or uh, or some uh, badge, uh, we have uh, we have found out uh, contactless uh, systems. Okay, so we had a little bit uh, of uh, issues uh, here that might happen. So, well, the first one is. Uh, if we miss the alarm, uh, how do we react? If we have an automated alarm system that wakes us up uh, uh, when we have an appointment or when we have to go to work based on uh, how, how long the trip takes, let's say. And then, uh, well, <laughs> if only something would make that for me, that, that would be awesome. But uh, then uh, we have uh, more ethical issues uh, or just trust issues uh, on uh, autonomous driving. Do we really need, need an autonomous driving? And uh, what, uh, what if uh, the system fails? We focus more on system failures also in the, in the train station where we remember, oh, did I close the door at home? Do I have an automatic system that did it for me? Did I close it? Did the automatic system close it? Uh, but I didn't really want to. That's uh, something that we have to address, yeah. Then uh, uh, about the train, the train could be self-driven, but uh, what if there is, if there is uh, something uh, unpredictable? So a person on the road, uh, a car uh, on um, a car on the rails that is stuck. How can uh, can the train react? Well, that's more et an ethical issue, but it should be addressed. And uh, then. Uh, about uh, the prediction on uh, at, uh, which bus stop we should uh, let's say we should we should go out from the bus uh, there is a, a question of which is the most suitable bus stop that has to take into account also disabilities because maybe some bus stops are just horrible for disabled people uh, it happens in Turin I mean. uh, and then uh, uh, when we go to Polito we would like to have uh, some uh, trip uh, that uh, takes us uh, with non crowded uh, places. Let's say we have COVID today, so we want to avoid uh, crowds uh, as much as possible. Does that address uh, the, let's say, the, the problems? Uh, and uh, last? So, so in, uh, in the last slide, we collected the common themes and the analysis on the topics in which AI should uh, come into. And in particular, we agree that uh, AI should uh, come into, into voice assistance, suggestion system, and maps. Uh, we posed some question about uh, uh, does it solve well, and does AI solve well a suitable problem? How may it fail, and how does it perform with respect to human doing the same thing? And in particular, for uh, voice assistant, uh, the first uh, answer is uh, yes, you can uh, delegate to voice assistants uh, some simple tasks, uh, but may fail in voice uh, recognition or may be uh, unable to solve uh, some simple task. Uh, and the uh, effectiveness is the same as the people uh, in general. For suggestion system, um, the system Maybe not perfect, but surely helpful in suggesting you some interesting things or not. 
and this is the field in which the system may fail, so may suggest you not interesting things related to your personal uh, interest. And um, the system works only if you um, give to, he, to it some feedback about the uh, uh, content market as liked or disliked. And uh, uh, the system is uh, more uh, effective than a uh, human or uh, people uh, in general because we require to uh, analyze a large amount of uh, data to uh, suggest you uh, new things. Uh, for maps, uh, um, in most of the cases, uh, automation works, but if uh, the map system uh, is outdated, it may suggest you uh, wrong routes or uh, a street that does not exist anymore, for example, or that are temporary closed. And uh, in general, it works uh, much better than uh, um, people, uh, but uh, as said, may may fail. So thank you for the attention. Grazie. Okay, thank you. Group number three. So okay. Okay, so okay, we started to analyze our journey maps depending on uh, the common themes and the differences because we sketched uh, in uh, in uh, between ourselves uh, our personal journey maps and then analyze what was in common among them and what were the differences and uh, we found out that. Uh, there are basically uh, three common themes, which are the usage of the smart alarm clock. Uh, all of us use it to wake up in a more performing way. And uh, another thing which is uh, common for all the three of all the five of us, but uh, I think that even most people uh, use them, is the usage of uh, like smartphones to receive notifications and updates about their daily lives in order to get updated and. Uh, get everything what, uh, what must be done during the day. And uh, the last thing in common clearly is uh, the fact that all of us follow the class and uh, we had done the exercise together, which uh, was an aspect that uh, brought us to use some common AI to, to do it. While for what regards the differences, a uh, strange one is the different uh, geographical areas which uh, we were in uh, during uh, last week since uh, one of us was in the US, another one was in the Bahamas, so we were like uh, really different time zones, uh, so it was kind of strange, but uh, we keep it up. And um, another thing that uh, is different among us is the fact that not all of us uh, uh, likes the addiction that we have to smartphones, also during the the daily routine in the morning and uh, for example during breakfast it, despite the fact that uh, common team is the usage of the smartphone for receiving updates not all of us like it because uh, we would like to have time for us and not for working let's say and uh, another thing that some of us find it useful but others don't uh, is uh, notifications for a google calendar because some of us use it others don't so so we sketched a, a shared journey map, which uh, is, uh, starts at, uh, let's say, uh, seven, half past seven, but just for the Italian people. So uh, all of us use the smart alarm clock to wake up. And uh, as I said before, uh, all of us uh, receive notifications and updates for what are the plans of the day. And some of us uh, use the Google Calendar. All of us started the lecture. And uh, at uh, 10 a.m., all of us uh, connected to Zoom, which is an important point for the consequent uh, aspects, which I will mention uh, after, uh, in order to get together and do the exercise. And uh, 
and then we we started doing the, the assignment. So these are the common themes and the differences considering AI. We found again a free and free. The clearly the one the first one is the smart alarm clock because all of us use it, so it was uh, kind of easy to, to find it. And another thing that uh, some of you may find it strange to be mentioned here is the usage of Zoom. But uh, we found on the internet that the Zoom uses uh, AI in order to improve its performance for the online conferences. So we think that uh, putting it here is uh, it's kind of a thing that might result in trusting for the class, interesting, sorry for the class. And uh, also the smartphone usage is a common theme for all of us. For what regards the differences, uh, the first aspect is that uh, some of people in the group uh, found it uh, really annoying, some uh, faulty features of AI in, the smart in their smartphones and had to manually repair it and disable it in order to avoid these kind of errors, which in particular was uh, something about the touch, which uh, was uh, felt even if uh, it was not a real touch. So the smartphones woke up and stuff like that. Another difference is that uh, some of us uh, like the vocal assistant, but uh, others uh, like find it really annoying. So it's uh, really weird how some people appreciate stuff that others don't and uh, actually they use it. And uh, just some of us would like to improve the performance of uh, AI in particular for the personalized features and uh, in the content it gives it give, give us. Others uh, would prefer to keep it more personal, let's say. So we go went through our analysis uh, like uh, tool by tool, but I will try to be really fast. For what regards the alarm clock, uh, in this case the, the fails are um, quite uh, not so important for what regards the humans. And uh, we found that m most of them are due to sensors, and uh, with uh, improved sensor they can uh, be solved. But uh, I don't think that people would like to get epidermical sensors to <laughs> to be woke up better. And clearly, the interaction paradigm is uh, it should just enhance human capabilities, but not be anthropomorphized. Uh, the second one is the content provisioning from uh, Google or the smartphone. And um, also in this case, uh, the, the interaction paradigm can be a little bit anthropomorphized, but uh, not that much. Otherwise, uh, uh, if you think that uh, some of us already dislike this idea, if uh, we push it too much, it would be really, really annoying. Then there is the vocal assistance and um, the current ones are not so accurate and uh, since it's a real uh, complex task there are technical solutions clearly and uh, they are being explored in the research and um, we think that uh, the interaction pattern which is more suitable for this tool is the smart tool and uh, allowing uh, so free control of electronic devices but not be anthropomorphized uh, again as well, Zoom is uh, clearly similar to the smart alarm. It uh, is uh, really technical and uh, not uh, so linked to humans. Mm, actually, all the, the issues which come from Zoom are, can be solved with the technical solutions. So it was quite a straightforward analysis. And finally, no. Oh, no, okay, sorry, this was the last one. And uh, that's it, basically. Okay. Thank you. Okay, group number four. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, um, even if we have a bunch of slides, I'd like to summarize our journey map in just one slide. So, which is this one. Uh, I think it's quite compact but full of uh, teams and so on. So firstly, uh, we uh, talked, we discussed in group uh, the main uh, 
the main areas of our journey map uh, and uh, we agree on the morning routine, the commuting, the building entrance and the work routine. So there were not many differences in our morning routines and even in action performed. The main differences were uh, the type of interaction that we had and the type of uh, uh, platform that we use in each of the steps. So then we, we started to define the type of interaction that we have with AI systems, uh, like the vocal interaction, uh, the, the touch interaction, like through touch screens or keyboard and so on, um, the physical uh, interaction that we mean uh, uh, interaction through sensors, so AI systems that senses the presence of the users and acts and uh, the face and physical recognition. So then we try to draw two kind of journey maps. Uh, the blue line is the actual journey maps, while the orange one is the expected and is the, the one that we think um, with a, a little bit of a improvement in AI it could, be, uh, could be achieved. Basically, uh, our journey map goes from unsatisfaction to satisfaction of AI systems. So we start from the morning routine with the wake up and the interaction with our smartphones and alarms and even uh, smart assistants, for example, uh, smart home automation that opens the blinds and so on. So this is a quite critical part because uh, um, a failure of AI system, for example, in set up the, um, the alarms uh, may be critical <laughs> because you don't wake up. Um, then in the breakfast part, we, we think that the breakfast is the, the highest uh, satisfaction in our journey map, uh, basically because it's uh, maybe it's because the, the AI does not intervene so much in, uh, in, this, uh, in this part, but uh, through appliances, smartphone, uh, especially smartphone used for uh, not working related tasks but much more for entertainment, uh, our satisfaction goes up uh, and the AI could improve this, um, uh, this experience through smart appliances uh, that are connected with our morning routine, for example, to make coffees and so on. Uh, then we get ready and we leave our house and um, none of us had any uh, build, building automation like uh, automatic alarm setups but uh, it could be uh, improved so when our house, when we leave the house uh, it locks and, and sets the alarms on. Uh, then the commuting part was the most uh, uh, Bipolar part, I mean, because uh, it's uh, these wa these waves represent uh, the annoying parts of commuting, for example, the, the traffic jams and so on. But the, the, the common the common theme of this part is the the, the, the usage of AI, especially through uh, navigation systems uh, or uh, music platforms uh, and so on that could be used when commuting by bus when commuting by car and um, to, to get to the destination. Okay. So uh, some improvement and the AI potential in this part we think that uh, is the possibility to choose different kind of uh, commuting, I mean uh, uh, choose the, the quickest uh, uh, route to, tra to travel to Polytechnical or the less uh, uh, the route that takes the less environmental impact, so there could be different objectives in other routes, or, or maybe the, le the, the, the least traffic street. Um, of course, uh, the pain points of this, um, of this area is that uh, the, the system uh, lives under uncertainty, so uh, we do not always know if the bus will arrive, if uh, the, tra the traffic jam actually exist or not, so this is the reason why of this uh, emotional uh, waves. Then at the building entrance uh, we uh, interact with uh, AI systems uh, mainly through 
physical presence, uh, face recognition. We talk about the uh, polytechnical scammer, and uh, uh, that could be a physical since uh, they they senses that your temperature is below 38 Celsius degree, or it could be a more mechanical way through uh, the smart cards. So. This is the, the era that we think it could be more improved uh, in terms of satisfaction because uh, um, basically it's an unknown part. Okay, so if the AI doesn't tell, <laughs> it becomes more annoying. Um, then we finish our journey map with working routine. Uh, we would like to uh, set up our working routine using uh, some AI components that actually we don't have uh, that would set up our working environment for example by launching some applications uh, or uh, remind, reminding us uh, the uh, calendars events during the day and um, this could be actually improved uh, uh, but the, the as I say, the misunderstanding of human objective could be a very critical part. So uh, it, it would be useful, but uh, even in this case, uh, it would be very, very annoying. So uh, this is the, the synthesis of our journey map. Then we go uh, a little bit on deep, and uh, that was the summary. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, group number five. Is there someone from room number five? into four sections, the wake up and breakfast. And um, for the wake up and breakfast, we had, we had four in the group. So um, three of us had things in common and just one person um, had something different. Um, so we have like waking up with an alarm and, um, and breakfast. And for example, I don't take breakfast in the morning. So that was the difference there. Um, and so AI can suggest uh, what we eat, what we can eat based on our diet or our health plan and uh, also play with um, AI online video games and um, for those who play video games in the morning. And uh, the second part was checking notifications and sorting our to-do list in the morning, um, maybe right after breakfast. Um, here AI can help us um, with optimizing some things, for example, our to-do list. Um, some of us decided that it's, we better do it like the night before, and some of us, um, for example, I do mine in the morning. So in the morning, it would be nice to like have um, a, a better overview of our to-do list so that we can really um, optimize things and not just trying to sort things out in the morning. And uh, also notifications of our social media platforms and basically showing us what is relevant, not just having a lot of notifications. And the third part uh, of our journey map is getting dressed. And also we had something similar with the other group, like recommending uh, the right clothing based on so many variables. And uh, we all agreed to this. Then the last part was committing to Polito and arriving at Polito. And basically on the way, sometimes we listen to music um, or sometimes um, we could just be checking one or two things. Or some persons could use the navigation if you're not very familiar with the route. And um, we uh, saw some things here that they 
jajík chud a sisto sweet. And I will skip uh, most of these slides because they are just like explanations of the um, other discussions. Okay. So for the different, um, the four categories are four breakdowns. We had we identify some things that actually concerns for us. So it's really good to have uh, some augmentation of so, some assistance, but um, there are some things that could fail or couldn't really meet up to our expectations. And um, I will just explain a bit of it. So for the waking up, for example, we have the food recommender or diet plan recommender, we have the smart alarm. However, we have a concern about um, not being update, not automatically updating based on our diet. So sometimes we can change this plan, and uh, the we have to always be the one to input what is new in our diet plan, and the system could not really help in these situations. And um, we also have for the smart uh, wake up smart wake up alarm. Um, it's possible that our battery could die if we forget to charge um, the phone the night before. And so this could really be a problem. And um, quickly move up to the next. So check notification and sort to do this. We also have a recommendation system here. And um, it's possible that because we always have this part where the human uh, has to update what is new in my list, what is, and the, uh, the system cannot always automatically know what we, the human, have that is new. And um, it could fail in this case because it doesn't take into consideration um, our new plan. And for the smart, um, I think, yeah, recommendation systems in different mobile apps, emails, uh, one of the concerns would be personal data collection and privacy breaches. Um, recommendations might not always be correct or of interest to the user. So these are some kind of concerns we highlighted. And of course, we also discussed based on based on the, the question that was asked, is it going to be purely technical solution or partially technical or partially considering people? And so we gave our opinion here as well. Um, if this system, recommendation system, or what we have in mind um, considers, uh, is just purely technical or it also considers the human. And most of the recommendations we had, for example, the food diet plan and uh, the to-do list would basically um, would basically not be purely technical because then it considers that we have changes to our diet plan and we have to impute these changes. And I think and for one other concern for getting dressed would also the same thing. It doesn't consider the human mood. It doesn't consider our mood during the day. It's possible to um, it's possible to have some configuration or some, some settings or even put these features into when, when uh, modeling, um, but some, some times this could not work or give us what we expect. And also in committing to Polito, it's possible that it fails to recommend the correct music uh, based on our mood or based on you know, what we are, the way we feel, and uh, this could be areas where it fails. And of course, we also gave our opinion on if it's partially technical or it also considers the human. And so uh, to conclude, we had, um, we identified the common themes among everything we discussed. And one of it is improving the, work, the flow of the day, um, improving our productivity based on the, the system. So the to-do list or the diet recommender or the, or the smart alarm they all have this common thing about improving productivity during the day. So this is what we have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, very quickly, the last two groups. Group number six. Uh, five. This one? Yeah. Okay. So we'll put a reflection there.
So our common journey map is uh, very much like uh, those one presented. So in the morning we value eyes mostly for alarms, notification, and uh, assistance like uh, if you have uh, the Alexa uh, connected to the Lavasta machine, you can uh, set the uh, coffee time and um, many other things. Then uh, um, for commuting to Polito, we used, uh, use uh, mostly um, our own uh, means of transport, so there's no much AI. Whereas uh, if you use maybe the dog service, uh, the, like uh, the, uh, the monopattino, <laughs> so um, that uh, uh, uses AI to track uh, your movement. And uh, this uh, has some problems uh, in, uh, in the privacy. We have some concern uh, about our privacy, or uh, it might fail to track. And uh, maybe in uh, some uh, areas, uh, it uh, no longer accelerates. So it needs a, better, a bit of improvement in that. So in working, uh, uh, I is used for optimization of workflows and uh, also reminders and notifications and in class uh, you might have some uh, uh, AI systems to take notes or networking or uh, granting access to places and services and uh, we also added uh, the last uh, part uh, if uh, you have uh, some free time or maybe in the evening to us AI is um, can be used for recommender system like Netflix or uh, Spotify but uh, it uh, shouldn't be too invasive uh, because it has to let you uh, wind down for the day or uh, if you don't want AI uh, you must have the possibility to shut, shut it off um, the common themes is uh, our, uh, mm, that AI should enable automation uh, repetitive processes and uh, is used for notification and reminders and uh, we all, all have uh, the, the concern about uh, the, um, the tracking and the privacy and um, the difference is, uh, is uh, between us we have different necessities so AI should take into account this and also our preferences and um, also the, as I said before uh, the possibility to uh, shut uh, AI off and for improvement uh, we need technical improvement to expand the abilities of AI and uh, where it fails uh, is uh, mostly due to user experience uh, how it's designed and uh, how it, it should improve uh, it should uh, take into account uh, the feedback if mm, both cases if negative or positive and uh, uh, should be flexible towards uh, user uh, specification. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, last group, right? Group number seven. Questo? No. Questo? So why you so? so uh, sí, sí, sí. Okay, good morning. Um, we question ourselves uh, about how the AI impacts on our daily routines. So we found as a common theme so the supplemental content uh, recommendation, uh, the navigation, and uh, um, some other uh, tasks uh, such as photography, running, and the smartwatch. And we also spot out some differences, such as a, a different way to interact with the AI, uh, some way more active and more passive. More active, for example, uh, with a running app and more passive with the social media recommendations. And also we found out also some uh, different ways uh, to use the, the, the AI, so that some enthusiastic and more critical uh, users. We also question on where the, should the AI come in. So, uh, of course, in smart uh, alarm and uh, for healthy habit suggestions, 
and uh, in uh, some cases where, where should not uh, AI come in, so we prefer to have less uh, sort of feed recommendations and uh, um, should not be too much privacy. This is uh, an illustrative uh, narration about, uh, about uh, how we uh, use um, and where and when we use uh, AI during our daily routine, uh, like this uh, imaginary uh, team that wakes up with a, a, a smart alarm while her sister is already uh, reading news on the on the, her phone, and then the uh, team goes running and uh, uses a, a, recommend, a recommend paste by uh, his uh, smartphone. Then we were running. He, he he takes a picture, and the AI um, improves uh, the the picture, and then he uh, drives to Polytechnico and uh, he uses um, navigation uh, AI to to get straight in time to the lesson. Okay, so we analyzed uh, the three main team, three main area that we have identified, so recommendation system, task augmentation, and navigation according to the, to the questions. So we find out that uh, in recommendation the problem is solved always, not always, but quite good. Sometimes our recommendation can be not perfectly tailored on the subject, so we um, we think that this could annoy the user with wrong suggestion. And uh, however, this requires not only a purely technical solution because uh, the user should be more involved in tuning the system, possibly with an easy interface to do so. And uh, instead for task augmentation like photo or running up, we identified that probably in most of the cases these AI solutions are quite good, in particular for not so experienced user, whereas on experienced user they could be also a limitation because maybe the picture uh, quality is uh, reduced by the AI for a photographer. So we can say that they are better on average, but they could be not so appealing for skilled users. So the best way is to provide a solution with a better interface. And maybe this could also be limited to, um, to a new technical design without involving directly the end user. In terms of navigation, again, we find that in most of the cases, the navigation solves quite good uh, the, the problem, whereas uh, it could also be in some cases wrong in the suggestion. But, uh, however, it's something that uh, could be fixed, uh, allowing the user to more easily interact with the system, providing additional feedback. So, overall, as a common solution, we find that the key is uh, designing the user center system that could provide more control over the design output and so enhancing the user experience. That's all. Okay, thank you for your very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I think that we are all on the same line and also the uh, key concepts of this course were evident in your presentation, so that's good. And I also think that this journey map will, will be useful also in your last exercise, so uh, during which you will have to decide, for example, a topic, a domain for your conversational assistant. And so I suggest you to take inspiration from your journey maps to identify one of these user needs during uh, in the journey map to, to decide the topic of your, of your uh, conversational assistant. Okay? So let's have a 15 minute break and then we will start with the exercise. Okay.